Hello, my name's Antonia Lloyd-Jones and I'm a translator from Polish. And the man in the picture behind me, see if I can show it to you, is the Polish novelist Tadeusz Konwicki holding his tyrannical tabby cat, Ivan. And this famous photograph was taken by Chris Niedenthal on the balcony of Konwitzki's apartment in central Warsaw, from where the Palace of Culture and Science, Stalin's gift to the Poles, is visible in the distance. You can see it there. And today I'm going to read to you from that same apartment where Konwitzki and his family lived for 50 years until his death in 2015. Uh, these days it belongs to the Polish Book Institute and it is now home to visiting translators on residences. So, the book I'm going to read to you from is called in Polish Czytadło, which could be translated more or less as pulp fiction. And although most of Konwitzki's work satirised life in communist Poland, the most famous of his novels perhaps being A Minor Apocalypse, this novel was written in the 1990s and it sent up the new Poland as it struggled to embrace capitalism and democracy. And the plot of this, this novella is like a surreal nightmare from start to finish. And it's largely set right here in this apartment. And these are the opening pages. I heard a steady, persistent knocking at the door. I say knocking, but it was more like the annoying banging of a door that hasn't shut properly. At first, my sleeping mind, directing its own dream, tried to explain this noise in a way I couldn't understand, but gradually, the real world began to crystallise. Before me, I saw a wall, an unfamiliar one, with shadows dissolving on it. And then on the corner of the pillow, I noticed a little black stain, like a drop of dried blood. And I felt a prickly, faintly throbbing pain in my forehead. Where am I? I thought. How did I end up next to a gloom-flecked wall? but the door was still rattling as someone yanked at it with force. Slowly, I got out of bed and mechanically walked towards the spot where the door should be. On the way, I overturned a chair, probably with my own clothes on it. Ahead of me, I saw a small blinking point of strong light. So this had to be my apartment, and that was my peephole in the smooth, dark plane of the door. Just a moment, I'm coming, I tried to say, but my throat refused to obey, and I only let out a croak, then coughed painfully. I turned the lock, and the door swung open of its own accord. I saw a young man, fair-haired but balding, in a light suit, with two policemen behind him. May we come in? asked the young man. Yes, but why? Just a moment and I'll tell you, he said, crossing the threshold, followed by the two policemen. What's up? I asked again. One of the policemen stayed by the open door. The other accompanied the young man, who was gently pushing me inside the apartment. There's been a murder, he said, and it occurred to me that I'd heard that line before somewhere. A murder? Where? I asked. And from the corner of my eye, I recognised my hallway and the big stand with our winter coats quietly hanging on it. At your place, in your apartment. I suddenly thought it would be good to laugh out loud, and I tried to do so, but he took no notice and pushed me further into the main room. Perhaps you should get dressed, he said, opening each of his remarks obliquely, as if he were an Oxford graduate. I looked down and froze in horror, I was only wearing my pyjama top. 
I started looking for the missing half, groping the length of the bed in vain, until finally I spotted my pyjama bottoms lying on the floor. The young man discreetly waited while I struggled with my clothes. Only then did he go up to the window and vigorously open the curtains. There I saw our main room in the first light of dawn. There was the bookcase, the television set with the dull glow of its glass screen, the overturned chair and my money tree, which had grown into a large number of thick stems with a scrawny crown of leaves on top. My name is Corsac, said the young man, and added something like Deputy Commissioner Corsac. We patrons of the old communist militia weren't yet accustomed to the new police terminology. I'm sorry, sir, I have a headache. I can't gather my wits. No wonder. You've got a bump on your forehead. Have I? I said, and went up to our old mirror covered in vintage blemishes. I touched a dark lump of clotted blood above my right eyebrow. The thin young policeman with a white baton hanging at his side, like a drawstring torn from his underwear, cast the plain clothes man a glance to point him towards our couch, which was a cross between a linen chest and a folding bed, occasionally used by our rare visitors. And I noticed that the morning chill was making me tremble, and I couldn't stop shaking. I coughed hard once and again to clear my throat. The young man, that's to say Deputy Commissioner Corsac, slowly paced towards the couch, stepping around the clothes scattered about on the floor. He stopped with his back to me and gazed a while at the oval shape of the rumpled blanket. Then he slowly leaned forwards and suddenly tore off that old blanket of ours which had been halfway around the world with us. All three of us saw a young woman lying on her back. With her mouth open, she was staring at the ceiling, her white breasts sloping towards her armpits, breasts as round as if drawn with a compass, and a clump of tussled dark hair at the junction of her legs. And if you want to know what happens next, you'll have to wait for me to translate more of it. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.